in a totalitarian society, what appeals to many people in a totalitarian society, Luciano, is that is that you lose all control over your life, but you gain great power over the life of your neighbor. There are people who live for that. You can snitch on your neighbor, you can hand them in, you can report them, and you destroy their lives. And there's people who would rather get, not be free, but be able to destroy somebody else's life than to be free and be responsible for all your own, your own actions. And welcome to another installment of Behind Greatness by Inspire. Luciano here speaking uh, as your host. Um, uh, also want to take the time here to remind you, the listener, please, uh, when you have the time, if you have the time, rate us uh, and share with your family and friends. Uh, this uh, will always be my ask. And uh, it would be great to, if you can, when you can. Uh, we are a registered charity as well, as uh, our regular listeners know. Um, and uh, if you want to donate to our cause, and, and our cause is really um, is really one driven by volunteers. So we're all volunteers here because we're also a non-for-profit. And we've been doing this for 10 years, our podcast for two years. Uh, and we give our time to speak uh, to people gladly all over the world uh, and to uncover messages of the truth of human existence. Um, today is not going to be any, <laughs> any different. Today is going to fall right into uh, what our mission is. Um, so today we have a guest joining us from, you're in Miami, right, Orlando? Yes. Yes. Okay. You're from Miami, so I want to make sure that you're in there, uh, that you're there uh, now. Um, his name is Orlando Guiteres Boronat. Uh, was born in Havana, Cuba in 1965. He holds a PhD in the philosophy of international studies from the University of Miami uh, and uh, has graduate and undergraduate degrees both from Florida International University. He has been an invited lecturer on political theory at the Global Leadership Program of Georgetown University and has worked as a professor of history and political science at institutions of higher learning for the past 20 years. Five of his books have been published and his articles have been have appeared, excuse me, in prominent publications in the US and abroad. Uh, he is a co-founder and spokesman of the Cuban Democratic Directorate, Directorio, one of the most prestigious organizations in the struggle for democracy in Cuba. Uh, Orlando has spoken at different convention, uh, excuse me, conventions and conferences around the world on Cuba's struggle for human rights and democracy. He is also the coordinator of the Assembly of the Cuban Resistance a unifying coalition of pro-democracy organizations inside and outside Cuba. He has a strong media presence, frequently being interviewed by different media venues on Cuba, uh, Latin America, and the struggle for freedom and human rights around the world. Welcome to the program, Orlando. Thank you, Luciano, for, for inviting me to participate. No, no, it's, it's our pleasure. And, uh, and I want to thank, uh, I want to thank our, our dear friend again, uh, as we thanked him um, uh, during last week's episode with, uh, with Luis, is Danny Torquia from uh, Torquia Communications. Uh, he and I have been, uh, have been friends, I guess, about 20 years, or maybe a little over. As with our previous guest, Luis, um, he also suggested that you and I connect to talk about uh, your story, but also... Uh, some of um, uh, some of the struggles you have lived through, and that you are uh, helping others live through, and uh, hopefully conquer, if we can use that word. Um, so thank thanks to him, uh, and I appreciate uh, the time that we've uh, that we've had to chat uh, in previous occasions as well, uh, leading up to this. Orlando, um, most most people know that there are uh, a lot of Cubans uh, in Florida. I did quick research, and there's a 1.5 million Cubans in Florida. Uh, I never did the research on uh, population in Cuba. So Cuba's got 11 million people. So uh, close to 11% of the population of Cuba uh, is outside of Cuba, just in one state. So this, I think... Uh, I think creates a really good backdrop with uh, some of the things that you're trying to do. Um, and one of them is with the directorio. Uh, explain for the listeners, if you don't mind, just to get us started, what is a Cuban Democratic uh, Directorate, Directorio? Well, again, thank you for having me in your program. And yes, you're correct. About 10% of Cuba's population is outside the country. Between Florida and other states in the U.S. and countries such as Spain, Mexico, and Canada, uh, there are about 10% of Cuba's population is outside 
outside Cuba. Directorio is a, an organization founded in 1990 with the goal of identifying and supporting civil society institutions which have emerged in Cuba to advocate for civil freedoms, respect for human rights, <clears throat> and an open political system. Um, and we support those, those um, cells of, of a free society in a country that has a very tight-fisted dictatorship through different means. Number one, by letting their case be known outside Cuba, particularly that of political prisoners and others who are persecuted. Number two, by putting them in touch with people around the world, especially in the Western Hemisphere, who can understand their plight and advocate for them internationally. And number three, by providing information to Cuba. We run a, a radio station called the Radio Republic or Radio Republica, which transmits every day on shortwave to Cuba. And we have thousands of listeners in the country. We also transmit through social media and AM, and we have an audience in Cuba. We've been transmitting since, uh, since uh, August 2005. So we do a great deal of, of work advocating for human rights in Cuba and other countries under dictatorships internationally, of mobilizing the Cuban exile community uh, to support change in Cuba and supporting those inside the island who have the courage and the integrity to stand up uh, for freedom. What I should have said at the beginning, uh, and I'll say it now, uh, for any listeners who want to have um, a good backdrop to what you and I are about to discuss, they, I, we really recommend, uh, really recommend the listener to listen to Luis's, uh, Luis's episode because it, it, it'll, it'll provide a really good grounding, a harrowing one, but necessary. Um, I say that now because I want to ask you the question, uh, you said one of the three things you do with the Directorio is you provide um, radio station communication, shortwave uh, communication into Cuba. Knowing what we know from Luis's discussion, it would be natural for me to ask you, how is this even allowed in, in Cuba, within Cuba? So by the government, obviously. And is it is it outlawed? Is it, uh, uh, are, are people in danger in um, uh, in being caught listening to your shortwave communications? Well, it's not allowed. It's punishable by law. Anyone listening to any station outside Cuba is guilty of, of a counter-revolutionary crime under the regime's law. The thing is, number one, Cuba has a strong radio culture. And there's a tradition of listening to shortwave for many decades. And it's very hard to jam or interfere shortwave because, you know, it bounces off the ionosphere and it falls on destinations like rain. So even if you open up umbrellas all over the country to try and prevent this rain or information from coming down, there will always be gas between the umbrellas. So shortwave does get through. Uh, the regime for a long time has persecuted this by if people's radios break, they'll take out the, when they take it to fix it, they'll take out the shortwave component which allows for the shortwave transmission or, or to listen into that transmission. But more and more people listen to shortwave, and especially after something I know we'll discuss further on, after the July 11 protests, when the regime brought down internet for, for several days, people relied on shortwave and AM radio transmissions a lot more. Why don't we talk about those uh, for the listener? Please bring us through the, uh, uh, the July 2021 uh, uprising. Um, so before we do that, I, I was just searching as well. There was uh, there were some mass arrests last month and convictions of hundreds of protesters, uh, most of them between the ages of 16 and 18, who are now sentenced to serve 20 to 25 years in jail. Yes. The regime arrested hundreds of, of people, most of them women and young men, many minors, for going out to the streets to protest for freedom and political change in the summer of 2021, on July 11, 2021. The demonstrations lasted for over a week, and there were some neighborhoods in Havana where the regime police could not enter for several days. Some very poor neighborhoods where the, the protests were strongest. The regime has, um, has put on trial several hundred of these uh, young people who were arrested, and condemned them to thousands of years in prison. And you know, right before I started this interview, I was reading an article by an American academic 
who in a very sophisticated way was legitimizing or justifying this kind of repression. Hmm. These protests were mostly peaceful, overwhelmingly peaceful, in the face of a regime that has been overwhelmingly violent. Yeah, as we've learned, yeah. You know, I can think of people like um, Loreto Hernandez, like Ariana perez Roque and others, couples who are in prison, their children being raised by grandparents. Uh, I can think of, of several pairs of sisters who are in prison. And this American academic says that these people were accused of violent crimes, and that's why they were sentenced. That is rubbish. These people are simply accused and sentenced because they protested on the streets. Because they, in a, in a country where there's no independent media, where there are no opposition political parties, none of the amenities which Canadians are used to and make up your, your free and democratic society, these don't exist in Cuba. And it's not because we're inferior to anybody else or because Cubans are predetermined to be robots of socialism, but because there's a very bloody dictatorship which doesn't allow it to happen because they know they'll lose power. So part of the problem with Cuba, and I'm deviating from what you asked, I, I, I apologize, is you know the, this structure of intellectuals, so-called intellectuals, professors around the world who justify that regime. You know, it's um, the, the great Italian left-wing intellectual Antonio Gramsci said that uh, exploiters around the world ruled through what he called a historic block of press, church, and state. Well, that applies to what happens in Cuba. What happens in Cuba, there's, there's one family that controls one party, that controls one armed forces, and they run the state for their own benefit. And it's, it's sad to see how in the, in the Western world, we have people in, in high positions, in positions of, of academic freedom and academic learning, we use this to justify this regime, but I'm sorry, I, I went off on a on a tangent. No, no, no please. I, I, we're, we're here also to be educated here. <laughs> so it's good. It's good to know this. And but so this all all of this makes. I mean, I I don't think I'm making a grand assumption. The fact that it's a peaceful protest shouldn't even matter. A protest of of any color would be a grand demonstration of courage, because. What we've learned and what we're learning from you as well is that um, the government there is uh, not shy in uh, violent breakdown and prolonged, prolonged uh, uh, physical and mental torture uh, of people who don't fall in line. Uh, it, what we learned from Louise is uh, every neighborhood has got uh, secret police and, uh, and folks who keep tabs on their neighbors every single block. That's a very, very important point. Well, to, to learn that these protests, that uh, a, um, uh, a part of Havana was blocked off to the police is probably, I'm, I'm making an assumption here, you tell me, is probably a really great feat, <laughs> considering how neighborhoods are constructed. It has marked a before and after in Cuban history. That had not happened before. There had been, there had been massive uprisings in the countryside in the first six years of the dictatorship that Del Castro established. Yeah. There was a massive um, insurrection of farmers in the central part of the island, in the, in the western part of Cuba, very strong uprisings. They were eventually crushed. They were put down. Entire families were taken from their homes and sent to, to concentration camps, disguised mm -hmm. as towns. It was, it was a very bloody affair, but not in the cities. The cities had been controlled by the regime. And this uprising is very, very important um, because thousands of people went out to the streets Almost simultaneously, um, <clears throat> it was dozens of cities, dozens of towns where these protests took place. And they had one chant in, in common, which was freedom. We want freedom. We want political change in Cuba. We don't want to be ruled by a single party anymore or a single ideology. We want to have choices. And also, you know, the, the Cubans suffer daily from, from these collapsing living standards that had to do with communist policies. Until 1959, Cuba was an agricultural powerhouse. It fed itself and it exported food to the US, to Canada, to Latin America. Because of communist policies, Cuba, Cuba's um, agricultural production collapsed. And today, 85% of what Cubans eat comes mostly from the US, but also from Canada. Yeah. In the US and Canada, we're not exporting food to Cuba, Cubans couldn't eat. You know, the second, the, the, the second largest um, income, national income for Cuba comes from the outside. It comes from remittances sent by family members who are living in Florida or living in other places. 
But I want to address your point, which is very important, which is about regime control of the everyday life of humans. Like any true totalitarian state, this regime early on set up a membrane of organizations between the state and the individual that existed at every level of your life. The Committees for the Defense of the Revolution, which existed in every neighborhood. The party nuclei, which existed uh, in every school, in every workplace. For example, there's a famous hospital in Cuba where every floor had a different party nuclei. Party nuclei are two or three communist party leaders who look over things. Uh, the assembly of popular power. I can keep on naming you institutions whose primary goal was to observe and supervise Cubans in everything they did in their daily lives. So you, you always felt there was a policeman right above your shoulder, looking over you. And I remember being a kid in Cuba, this feeling of being watched over, this dread, you know, and also a rejection of it. I think the July 11 protests happened because to a, a great degree, this membrane has fallen apart. And it's fallen apart not because the regime has dismantled it, but because, but due to the fact that the ideological component is, is gone, Cubans don't believe in this revolution anymore. A vast majority of the Cuban population long ago has seen the re, through the regime's uh, promises and they've seen through the socialist lie and they know they're not living in socialism, they're not living in a free society, they're not living in, in, in any kind of, of government which respects human rights. They're living in a one family, one party dictatorship. Uh, so the second reason this membrane of control has fallen apart is the economy. Since there's no ideological motivation, the regime has to buy informants. It has to pay informants, mm -hmm. just like the secret police did in, in East Germany. The sanctions that were applied by Trump and that President Biden has mostly maintained have struck at the, at the purse of the regime's armed forces. So it's harder and harder for the regime generals to move the money they have stashed away because the shell companies, the banks they had set up around the world to launder money have been closed off by these sanctions. First by the sanctions levied on the regime and then by sanctions levied on the, Russian, on the Russian banking system as a result of the aggression against Ukraine. So they're in a very tight spot economically. And for those who might tell me in Canada, but listen, you know, this, this tourism uh, helps the people. No, it doesn't. I mean, it's, it's, been, it's been documented in U.S. federal courts. It's been documented by the regime itself. The armed forces control 85% of the Cuban economy. They control most of tourism. And the money from tourism goes to the armed forces. It goes to the military. And it goes to the, 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 the group of small generals that control the rest of the economy. So, um, for example, in, in three years of U.S. cruise tourism to Cuba, the regime made about $300 million, probably over. During those same three years, they didn't build a hospital. They didn't uh, reconstruct the school. They didn't pave the highways. They didn't raise salaries. Cubans never saw that money. Where is it? Where did that money go? And people have to understand that, especially in Canada. As we begin this conversation and this reflection on Canada's influence on Cuba, you have to understand uh, that in Cuba, what you have is a very small oligarchy of families, um, mostly military, which live off the rest of the Cuban people like parasites. Right. So if I'm an ambitious fellow, um, and I don't want to leave Cuba, and I want to advance my um, economic state, uh, I would necessarily look to joining the military in order to move through the ranks because that's where the money flows. You would need two things. You would need to join the military, but most of all, you need family connections. Right, right. If you're not part of that small grid of interconnected families who control the military, you don't get into the inner loop. And you can have generals or generals, they have the designation, but they're not, they don't have access to the money and the influence that a small group of generals have access to. I think it's good for the listener to understand as well what your, uh, what your personal experience was with the regime, because you were born, as we mentioned at the beginning, you were born in Havana, uh, and you were a little child when you left. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean it's less important to understand what your family went through as well, because uh, I, I think this gives a, a really good dimension uh, into understanding how uh, how tight of a grip um, uh, that set of beliefs, that ideological set of beliefs had on people uh, who just wanted to have a better life. Uh, you want to bring us to that? When uh, your, your dad decided, when you were very little, your dad decided that he wanted to leave Cuba? Uh, 
I come, like a lot of Cubans, I come from a large, extended, and very unified family. Um, I like to think that I grew up, I grew up in a clan, uh, not in a, in a small urban family structure, but a very large family of extended cousins, very unified. And my parents, like many other Cubans, believed in the revolution initially. They believed that the, the effort to overthrow Batista would lead to free democratic elections, to the restoration of the Constitution of 1940, to needed social reform, which was included in that Constitution, and to having a, a, a clean, honest government that, that would, would rule Cuba. They had also seen, my parents and my grandparents had seen the incredible pace of economic growth in Cuba. My country was devastated in the last war of independence. In 1898, Cuba was, was ruined, was destroyed. Uh, 200,000 Cubans had died in the war of independence. The economy was shattered. Um, there was a great deal of disease and hunger. And out of the ashes of that last war of independence, Cubans built a republic that in the first 20 years had achieved incredible uh, economic growth and also improvement in life for thousands of Cubans. That's documented. So my parents thought, like many other Cubans, that what Cuba needed was a good, honest government. In 1952, uh, the military had overthrown the constitutional government, and that had initiated uh, a political crisis that culminated in a widespread armed rebellion against the regime. My parents thought that once Batista was out of power, um, there could be a quick return to democracy, and then the country could keep on growing, as it had been growing. Cubans had been very adept at, at, the, at uh, managing their economy. Um, and again, we can go over these statistics if you want later, but it was the growth of the country was impressive. And my parents, you know, I'm, I'm proud to say this, my, my grandfather on my father's side, he barely got through fourth grade. You know, he, he, he was a child during the wars of independence and um, he was in the countryside. And in his lifetime, my grandfather, who probably did not finish fourth grade, saw all three of his sons complete university degrees. This in a small island, dependent on, on sugar, but it shows you the pace of growth of the Cuban economy. So my parents believed that Cuba was in the right course, I just needed political reform. And sadly enough, they soon saw what was supposed to be a democratic revolution that promised elections within 18 months of taking power become first a revolutionary socialist dictatorship and then a communist dictatorship. The free press, Cuba had an abundant free press. It had early TV, it had radio, it had newspapers, it had a very vibrant public discourse. Um, even Batista had a, had a free press that constantly criticized him. Castro, while he was opposing Batista, published in the Cuban press. I think he published over 50 articles in the, in the three years he was, in, he was fighting Batista in, in the mountains. So Cubans were used to a certain level of freedom uh, under any government. And my parents saw all this disappear. My mother was an avid reader. She was a teacher. And she hated to see how books all of a sudden disappeared from, from shelves or were censored. And they made the decision they didn't want me growing up in that kind of system. Um, it was a decision the family consulted. They also supported their decision. Since my father was an electrical engineer who had worked for 30 years in a Cuban electric company, they, um, they made us wait five years before we could leave. My father was assigned to a work camp outside Havana, where you had to spend time working in order to fulfill some kind of debt to the regime that they came up with. Your dad expressed the desire to leave Cuba, had to declare it to government officials in order to get, I guess, a, a passport in order to do that. And instead, he was assigned to a, a quasi-concentration camp for five years. <laughs> well, while they considered his request to leave. <laughs> while they considered, right. So he was, he, so he was sent there and, and had to fulfill this in the hopes to get documentation to leave. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. There were some who had it worse. Some were, my, my father could come home every evening, evening from the war camp. There were others who had to stay there. Wow. It was, they were incarcerated there. Um, while we waited for first government permission to leave and then visas to get out. So eventually we found a visa to Spain. We left through Spain, from Spain we went to Nicaragua, and from Nicaragua we came to the U.S. Let's stop there for a second because I want to talk about your your mother and your mother's side as well. But let's let's fill in some details because this is folks folks in the, in the Western world and Northern Hemisphere only see these things in movies. So let's go to a couple of scenes as well where you were your family was about to leave, but you were evicted from your house before uh, your flight. 
Yes, back then in Cuba, back then in Cuba, when you were going to leave the country, uh, you had to leave your house, surrender all your belongings about two weeks before you left. Some people had to spend as much as a month waiting until you were assigned when you could leave, when you could get on a plane to leave. Huh. So I, I vividly remember my parents getting rid of all, you know, handing out to neighbors and to friends our belongings so as not to give them to the state. I remember a guy dressed in green, a military guy going to my house, into my apartment to where they want my parents to register and inspect everything. That's, that's a pretty jarring memory. You see somebody with a gun going into your house to make sure there was nothing there which could damage the regime. Including? And, hmm? Including? What did he find? Well, he found something extremely dangerous for the regime. At that moment in time, the regime had prohibited the consumption of pork. Pork is essential to Cuban diet. Okay? Especially mm -hmm. back then. And my parents had some illegal pork hidden away in the freezer. My mother had forgotten about it when she was getting rid of everything else. My dad had gone to a cousin's to take him some, some American razor blades he had because there were no razor blades to be found, so we went to take him to him. And the militia man found a, found a pork. And I clearly remember, Luciano, this guy getting the pork, throwing it on the kitchen table and saying, this will cost you your, your exit from Cuba. And I remember my mom going pale out of fear. And the lady who accompanied the militia man, the head of the local committee for the defense of the revolution, she took the pork and she said, no, 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 we're not. That's not going to happen. We're going to eat it right here. And she started cooking it in my kitchen, <laughs> in our kitchen. And this guy sat there and, you know, he savored the pork to the last bite. And then he signed the paper and said, okay, fine, you can leave. You know what that is? You know, the, the kind of powerlessness you feel at that moment. Uh, I'll never forget that. Without, I mean, obviously there, there are many things at play, but without that woman coming in to understand that uh, maybe this was unreasonable and not having cooked that, you, your, your parents possibly could have been jailed, never mind just remained in, in Cuba, but gone through some sort of hardship that, you know, we obviously learned through Luis can happen and does happen in Cuba. You could have had a very different trajectory of your life. Exactly. Over pork. Over pork. And when we were at the airport to leave, this I don't remember, but my parents told me. Um, there was a little girl there leaving with her parents, and then her grandparents, who were devout communists, showed up with the militia and said, uh, our granddaughter doesn't want to leave. So the seven-year-old girl was separated from her parents, put in a room with the militia and, uh, and the grandparents, convincing her to stay. And my mother said, everybody in that room, they would put you in a room that they called the fishbowl. It was a... It was a room that had, you know, it was transparent uh, walls, it was windows, whatever. And there you waited to leave. They separated you. They segregated you from anybody else who was traveling because you were leaving the country. And at that moment for the regime, that was a, a show of, of defiance and resistance because you were disaffected, obviously, and you wanted to leave the wonderful revolution. I'm being sarcastic. That's what Castro was building. Uh, again, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm being uh, sarcastic with this. This little girl was separated from her parents for over an hour, trying to convince her to stay. And she insisted on reuniting with her, with her parents. And they finally brought her back with her parents. My mother said that you could feel everybody sighing in the room. Wow. And when, when we got on the plane, the plane took off. The little girl told her parents in Spanish, she said, are we finally leaving? And everybody in the plane started clapping. Wow. And applauding. Wow. Right. Because they felt the relief. They were, also, it was a Spanish plane. It didn't belong to the regime. So they knew the crew was not with the regime. Yeah, they're Spanish. These are powerful stories. I don't remember that story, but my parents kept on telling me about it and what happened. I do remember when we were leaving the militia man, my mom had her wedding ring on. She had forgotten to take it off because you couldn't take anything out. You couldn't take money from the bank. You couldn't take, I think you were very limited in how much money you could take out of the country. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly no valuables, no, your, the list of things you could bring with you that were yours was very limited. Yep. She had left her wedding ring on. And I remember them. I do remember the militia man saying that stays here. And my mother hesitated. And my father said, don't worry, I'll buy you an even better one when we get to where we're going. And she took off her ring and handed it over. I mean, that's the kind of, you know, individual personal humiliation communism puts you through. My parents were not organized opponents of the regime. They were simply disaffected. They did not agree with the course the people was taking. And they went to the very painful decision to leave behind a great deal of family so that I could grow up in a free country. It's uh, it's incredible how strong beliefs really are. Everything stems from our beliefs. Everything, everything, uh, everything wrong. I mean, if we're going to say wrong and right, everything wrong, everything right comes really from our belief. I agree. I agree. 
I think I think people live as they think. I disagree with Marx when he said people, you know, uh, live. Uh, people think how they live. No, no, no. You live how you think. Hundred percent. Hundred percent with you. And um, so I had interrupted you a couple of minutes ago. You said your mother's side of the family. So I didn't want to forget that. From my mother's side of the family, I come from a family that's been from people who've been in Cuba. Some of my ancestors were on the beach when the Spaniards arrived. We were there first. Wow. You know, I come from very old Cuban lineage. Wow. Um, from the eastern part of Cuba, uh, which was the first part of Cuba to be, to be settled. Yeah. Part of my family has Taino ancestry from eastern Cuba. Mm-hmm. And, you know, again, my mother belonged to two extended clans from, from eastern Cuba. Decent, hardworking people um, who had lifted up, you know, who loved their land. They loved living there. Um, Cuba's eastern part is just like in Canada. I mean, you have a slightly different culture uh, in different parts of the country. Sure. And three of her cousins fought against Batista in the revolution. Hmm. Um, and of those three, they all reached a certain rank in the rebel army. One remained with the revolution as a committed communist. Another rose very high in the ranks and he became disenchanted very early on with what he saw. And a third member was executed. He was tried and executed within 24 hours. One of my mother's first cousins. And in my culture, a first cousin is like a brother. Right. It's a, it's, it's a very tight unit. So, again, they had believed this could be something good for Cuba, and they were severely disappointed in what followed. Well, well I mean, she could have gone the other way. If she had these three cousins, one of them, uh, one of them stayed ide- ideologically with the, with the Castro regime. Uh, she could have gone that way as well. She could, but my mother was, my mother was a brilliant woman. She was very well-read. And before 1959, she already knew what communism was. Um, that's why Fidel Castro never said he was a communist before he had full power. Right. Because you had enough, enough educated people in Cuba who understood what the goods were. And the, Cubics, the Cuban Communist Party had a reputation for being opportunist, for having established uh, partnerships with, with dictators like Machado and Dan Batista. They were not very prestigious. Um, and my mother, especially in the 1956, a lot of people don't remember this, but in 1956, the Soviet Union invaded Hungary. And that had a big impact in Cuba. People did not like a large country invading a small country mm. to impose a regime that the Hungarians had not voted for. Um, We've seen that being all, replayed, eh? Yeah. And then Fidel Castro, exactly. Yeah. And Fidel Castro kept on saying that the revolution was not red, that it was green, that it was a like Cuban revolution, that he wasn't communist. But my mother saw, and my parents saw this, this progressive move towards communism. And also, I remember my father, he was an electrical engineer. He, he would remark to me that the, the delegations of Russians and Bulgarians and Czechs would come to Cuba. And Cubans were used to U.S. technology. You know, there was plenty of it in Cuba. Yeah. And my father, remember, I remember him saying, these people are shocked by what they're seeing here. They've never seen the kind of technology we have, thanks to our proximity to the U.S. and our trade with the U.S. Mm-hmm. So, and the Bulgarians and Russians would tell my father what it was like living under communism. Uh, the lack of freedoms, the privations. My father said, that's what's coming here. I don't want to be here. Yeah, because we're going to lose a certain standard we already have. I laud your parents for, um, uh, for, facing, for facing that ideology um, uh, and not wavering, because that's, that's not easy. I mean, I, I come from a country where things have come a little easy to us. <laughs> As, um, uh, we, we were just at a, uh, a, a Can- actually Canada Day. So Canada Day is uh, July 1st, uh, 4th of July. It's, it's, so it's our 4th of July. It's on, it's on the 1st of July. And so we, we spend it uh, usually with um, my wife's side of the family. And she's got uh, an aunt and uncle who I respect uh, immensely. And uh, I think the uncle now is about 80. Uh, big, tall guy. I always has an opinion kind-hearted like he has like all the all the good attributes you can uh, you can think of and he was uh, he he took a lot of time talking to my kids he hadn't seen my kids in years because of covid and so forth and uh, my kids came home and they're telling me about what zio vince uh, uh was explaining to them about growing up uh, poor in the mountains post-world war ii and he says uh canada is the best country you can live in but there is a problem with living in canada is canadians have never seen have never seen a bomb land on their territory Wow. Right. Right. Wow. Changes your mentality. So I, yeah. so what I, what I, what I want to, what I want to tell you is I, I have no understanding. Like I, I would stand with your parents and their decisions, but I have no understanding because I haven't lived through that. I haven't lived through uh, 
uh, a belief system that imposes itself with force and brutality. I have no idea how I would react. I would think that I'd react a certain way, but you'll never know until you live through it. And your parents lived through it. And with a, I mean, your dad, I guess you were two years old when your dad decided, you know, screw it. If you're going to put me in a concentration camp during the day, I'll do it. And you did that for many years with one single, uh, uh, one single goal in mind. I thank you for saying that. I thank them every day. Every day I thank my parents for, even though it was very hard, my my father never saw his father again, never saw his brothers again. Uh, It was difficult. Um, Let me tell you two quick quick things I wanted to add. First of all, Cuba had one of the largest middle classes in all Latin America. My father was an electrical engineer. My mother was a teacher. They honeymooned in Canada. They, uh, They went to Niagara Falls. They went to Montreal. They loved Canada. And they always talked about going back to Canada and never did, but they, they had a very good image of what Canada was like, uh, a free, prosperous, tolerant society. Mm-hmm. Um, they love the falls. They love Montreal. I've never been to Montreal, but they, they, they love both. And my, my father was an avid reader of newspapers. He loved to buy several papers and read them and, and go over them every morning. And then to him, it was a blow to his intellectual curiosity that the country was reduced to one or two papers that said the same thing. Yeah. You know, he felt the lack of freedom there. He was probably yeah, intellectually uh, offended. Yeah. Exactly. He said, I'm an adult. I'm being treated as if I were a child, but I, I can't listen to different points of view and come up with my own ideas. And let me tell you something, something I also remember from Cuba. Uh, my mother told me, don't tell anyone in school you're leaving the country. Because once they know you're mm. leaving, then you're adverse to the regime. So off I went to, to my kindergarten class, um, and I loved my teacher. And uh, the teacher started asking who was leaving because she wanted to get ready since it was going to break her heart to lose her students. She wanted to know who was leaving the country. And me and another kid um, raised our hands. And I noticed other kids whom I knew were leaving, they didn't raise theirs. They were smarter. From that point on, my teacher became my enemy. You know, I couldn't go to the bathroom. Uh, my lunch, our lunch periods were were shorter, me and the other kid who had raised her hands. Wow. If I brought toys, they were confiscated. And then it was a dilemma. Four Four or five years old. It was a dilemma because I come home and my mother would say, don't tell your father what's going on because he will go and confront the teacher. Yeah. And um, I do remember they confiscated. It was very hard to to find toys in Cuba at that point in time. And I took some toys to school. She confiscated them as part of this campaign that began when I said I was leaving the country. And my father did find out about that, and he did go to the school. And, you know, I remember the words he said, but as a child, I didn't have an understanding of the, what, what lay be behind him. But he told the woman, you know, we believed in a, a democracy was calling and not this kind of fellow you imposed on us. Because he couldn't, you know, he just told her everything he had on his mind. Um, Dangerous. But that, that was an extreme risk. A school yeah. discussion was an extreme risk. Because you had people watching, you had people taking notes. In a totalitarian society, what appeals to many people in a totalitarian society, Luciano, is that is that you lose all control over your life, but you gain great power over the life of your neighbor. There are people who live for that. You can snitch on your neighbor, you can hand them in, you can report them, and you destroy their lives. And there's people who would rather get, not be free, but be able to destroy somebody else's life than to be free and be responsible for all your own, your own actions. Isn't that sad? Like that's the that's the only type. That's the only type of freedom that a totalitarian state gives individuals is uh, to impose over others like the state is imposing over you. And so, you, yeah, like what, what you're really doing with a totalitarian state is that you are, you are raising bullies or, or you're, picking out, you're picking out the folks who would be good bullies. <laughs> and they rule. Yeah, and they rule and they rule. Your grandparents. So you're you're now you're now in the states. Uh, you're a little kid. You're you're growing up in uh, literally mini Cuba because there's so many Cubans. You said West uh, Westchester. Is that right? Yeah, Westchester. Uh, That's a very neighborhood Cuban in neighborhood in in, in Miami Dade. Uh, and you said your your grandparents uh, they gave you books when you were about twelve or thirteen, and they asked they did I remember this correctly that they asked you to figure out. Uh, um, uh, the facts about Cuba on your own, and you did? Yeah, you, you have a great memory. Um, I left Cuba, we left Cuba in 1971, but we didn't leave the Cuban nation. I mean, when we got to, 
when we got to Florida, the Cuban population is so large and so unified that I, and my family was, was so large and so united. There were, there were always family gatherings for religious reasons, for birthday reasons, any, any kind of reason. Any kind of reason was an excuse to get together as a family. Right. And there were happy moments, you know. But I grew up within that space. And in that space, Spanish was spoken. I had several generations present there, so I heard the living history of my people from different generations across time. There was a deep sense of solidarity. If somebody got was sick, everybody rushed to the hospital. Um, very deep sense of, you know, people support each other. Um, and in a Cuban family, family is not just blood ties, it's friends. Friends become part of family. It's probably like, that way with the Latin groups, but I just remember from a new experience. I get it. I get it. Yeah. And um, within that fold, I was actually within the spiritual space of the Cuban nation, a non-communist Cuban nation. Within because the they remember patriotic days, a spiritual space. I remember my elementary school was a public school. There was only one kid who was in Cuba. All the other kids were of Cuban origin. So to me, it wasn't clear what had happened. We left Cuba, now we're here, but everybody's Cuban. I wasn't very clear on it. I was very little kid. Um, Spanish was spoken in my home, but English was spoken at school. I quickly learned English, and, and TV my, was, was an English show. But, um, but, but something that, that, that happened was when my turn 11, 12, you know, um, you grew up fast within a Cuban family. By 15, you're considered a man or a woman. Uh, you have certain responsibilities. You're spoken to differently. And things are expected of you. And um, part of the expectation was, and it's funny, but because my grandparents and my parents coincided in that, um, was to give me the information about what had happened, why we were away from Cuba, the objective reasons for the sadness I felt in my family. At that point in time, there was another cousin of ours who was serving an 18-year prison sentence for opposing the regime. And I remember how much his, his mother and brothers missed him at every event. Eventually, he left Cuba. He, he came here, a wonderful cousin, uh, whom I love dearly, but, but his absence was, was very much felt by the family. And my father had a series of long conversations with me, tell me what, from his point of view, had happened. And he would always end the conversations by saying, but you have to determine on your own what happened. You decide. Hmm. Gather the information, read. You have to know what happened. Even if you don't want to be Cuban. You, know, you want to give up on what we are. Just see Good what happened. Awesome, Good awesome parents. Holy yeah, smokes. my parents were awesome. And my mother began to give me books to read. My grandparents gave me some really good books and said, read this and you decide. And I did. I started reading and reading and finding out. And I came to the conclusion, the, excuse my expression, I came to the conclusion that Cuban people had been shafted. That my parents had not put that idea in my head or my grandparents. I came to that conclusion. When I read what Fidel Castro had promised the Cuban people when he was in the mountains and when he delivered, I said, no. This was. You know, you didn't change the story until you had the country firm in your grip, right? And the amount of suffering that's been inflicted on Cubans, the deterioration in Cuban national life does not justify any of these ideological decisions. Um, so with my realization came also my commitment to do something about it. In my idealistic young, young man, I, I want to try and help my end this, in this pain. So I began to get involved in the, in the Cuban exile movement, which is very strong. And that was, uh, sorry, that, so that was in your kind of mid-teens, right? You're 15, 16. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. You know, I, 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 have, I have two teenagers, um, and uh, much like other teenagers, they're just engrossed in their phones. Um, the problems that they have are, uh, are in the digital world, but they're not suppressed like they are where we're learning uh, in your old part of the world is. And you have 16-year-olds in Cuba who just want the freedom to live their lives. That's all they want. And now they're facing 20, at 16, they're facing 20, at 16, they haven't murdered anybody. <laughs> they're facing 20 to 25 years in jail. Okay, it's, again, I'm going to say this because I'm like a softy, I'm a softy North American, right? Uh, I can't comprehend this. Totalitarianism lies beyond our logic our Western logic of freedom. It's, a, it's an evil entity, it's, it's a monster. It, it works on the, on, the, on the worst of human nature and it, and it distorts, that, distorts that nature even further. At the beginning, it takes power by manipulating people's best ideals or best instincts of social solidarity, and, but then it twists that terribly just to stay in power. Let's talk about uh, how, how the rest of the world is actually contributing to this. No, uh, so Americans obviously aren't uh, vacationing in Cuba, but 
Canadians and Europeans are in large numbers and have been in large numbers? How have they been contributing to the totalitarian way of life? I think at some point in time, somebody decided, people like Herbert Marcuse, these prominent intellectuals, they decided that Cuba was the place to take a stand against the U.S. 90 miles from our shores, they believe this whole black legend that Cuba was a, simply a sugar-producing plantation with a lot of poor, poor people uh, and oppressed people. That wasn't the case. Um, and so there's a whole structure which is sought to romanticize that regime. And whereas the human rights violations of right-wing Latin American regimes have been denounced thoroughly throughout the world, there's mutinous about what happens in Cuba. And today, as of now, that one family, one party military regime is being financed mostly by Canada and Western Europe. Countries like France, Italy, Spain, and Canada. And through institutions like the Club of Paris, they're just pumping money into that, into that regime and allowing it to survive. That's my opinion of it. I'm not imposing on everybody because I came to my convictions by reading and reasoning and talking about things and studying. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to impose my, my ideas on any Canadian. I simply invite Canadians to take a, a, a good, hard look at what really happens in Cuba. And you know, in the past few weeks that we've been traveling to Canada and meeting Canadians, a lot of Canadians have gone to Cuba a lot. And of the, the ones I've spoken with, they know what's going on. They told me, you know, I've been there three times. I can't deny it. There's something really wrong there. Uh, the people are great. I know the people are great. My people are, are exceptional people. They're good people. Um, but th that regime is vicious. And there's even Canadians who've told me in prior conversations, I know they're following me. You know, I know I'm being followed. One Canadian told me, my girlfriend showed me pictures that they had taken while I was under surveillance. Their father worked for the secret police. Why put up with that? If that's being done to a Canadian, what do you think they do to Cubans? I mean, there's a, there's a group of Canadian diplomats that were, that were attacked and severely hurt by directed energy weapons in Cuba just three years ago. That's been a, that case has been very well documented in the U.S. Canada hasn't said that much about it, but those diplomats have been hurt. Who do you think did that? Why would they do that? And that, again, I repeat, if that's done to Canadians and Americans, what do you think they do to Cubans? So I, I, I urge Canadians, I plead with you to take a, take a step back, look at that regime, and what's going, on, what's going on now in the history of the Cuban people, Canada has tremendous potential influence on Cuba. 40% of all Cuban tourism comes from Canada. 40%? 40%. Holy Canadian, smokes. Canadian investment is huge. And at the right moment, the right place, Canada can have a real influence in helping Cuba achieve democratic change. Again, thank you for sharing that. I, I did not know that that number was so high. Yes, it's very high. Wow. Uh, no wonder, no wonder you were in Canada uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, yes. Um, and we want to keep on going. Oh, well, that's great. That's great. Um, and I'm glad we were put together. Uh, again, I, I mean, I, I love to be educated, uh, especially, uh, by people who have lived through something that, uh, I, I could never have, uh, I could never have experienced. Um, that's how I enrich my perspectives as well. Uh, and yeah, I mean, that's why we have listeners because our listeners, uh, feel the same. Um, your daughter speaks Spanish. Fluently. Uh, but you said an old Spanish. Well, because she grew up listening to my mother who spoke very traditional old Spanish, so she has all those idioms. So a very traditional Spanish, Spanish. Uh, Spanish spoken in Cuba from like the 40s and 50s. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny. She's very American. Very American young person, but when she goes into Spanish, she becomes a Cuban from the 50s. Oh, that's it's great. The, is, isn't, that, isn't that wonderful how different languages, and that's something, uh, so w with my kids growing up, I only spoke to them in Italian. And oh, wow. It, uh, it, it's wonderful because it, it gives them a different perspective. Like it, it makes them, it also makes them more curious about people that are different than they are. So they're fully bilingual. Well, they were fully bilingual. Now, I mean, and now I only speak to them in English, but uh, mm -hmm. the, the roots are there. The roots are completely there. So it's uh, now they're a little bit older, but I, I spoke to them in Italian until they were age 12, something like that. Then it was getting tiring for me because I, you know, I, I live, uh, I, I live in a, in an Anglo, uh, in an Anglo environment, right? Uh, but, and you know what, maybe I'm just creating excuses for myself, but this is not about me. Um, so what, um, I mean, it, it seems to me the, the Italian family structure and the Cuban family structure are very similar. Uh, in how 
Yeah. So yeah, right. They are. And, um, the, the way you're speaking about how, uh, uh, cousins and friends are regarded in families, it's, 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 it rings very, very close to my own experience. So yeah, absolutely. There is something about the Latin, uh, Latin culture in general, like the Portuguese, the Spanish, Hispanics, Latin Americans, Mexicans, the energy is all very, very similar when it comes to family structure. Very, very similar. Uh, almost spooky that way. Considering how uh, uh, how many how many there are and how how far how far they are from each other geographically. I mean, when we talk about countries, but we're all the same. We're all the same. We all we all. Uh, as my uncle used to say, "We all swim in the same soup." <laughs> um, uh, it's been it's been a pleasure. Uh, it's been a pleasure here, Orlando. Um, uh, one last question before I go. I'd like to list. I'd like to ask this question, and I ask this question, of course, to uh, to Luis. What is greatness to you? Great question. Greatness to me is having the sensibility, no matter what your, your education may or may not be, to understand that there's things that last forever and that those things which last forever and are of intrinsic value aren't immediately visible. And to pattern and live your life based on those things which cannot be seen but are essential to life, to me, is the mark of greatness. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Orlando, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Luciano. You're a very good interviewer. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, well, thanks to Denny Torquia for putting us together so we can have this experience. Certainly. Thank you again. Hey, it's Enrico Colantoni here, actor, director, and dedicated napper. Like what you heard today, there's more to come. Make sure to subscribe to Behind Greatness and learn about our live events at inspirenorth.com. You'll also find links to our social media right on our website, so be sure to give us a like and follow. Until next time, stay inspired. <laughs>